The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science, beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. send out a special thank you to all of you who are listening to this podcast. It has been really exciting to see my listening audience grow, and I am really honored to have my podcast be part of your world. This podcast is made possible through my Audible affiliate account at audibletrial.com slash math science history, where you can go and receive a free audiobook download as well as a 30-day free trial. But this podcast is also sustained through your generous contributions, which I am so very grateful for. You too can visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. Click on that coffee cup on the right side of my website and buy me a cup of coffee or two or three or four because every cup of coffee that you buy keeps this podcast up and running. The date was May 17th, 1975. It was just eight days before my ninth birthday and the package arrived right on time based on the eight to 12 week window required for shipping and handling. I took the box and ran to my room, carefully carrying the package as though it contained fragile antique glass. Cautiously, I opened it. It was a sight to behold. It was my very first secret spy scope pen fully equipped with a six power wide field magnifier and a 30 power full microscope. Between this, my x-ray glasses and my specially developed cryptography code that anybody could probably figure out, my spy days were finally underway. At the age of nine, I was obsessed with 007 stories and Nancy Drew mysteries. I really thought I had the cryptography down pat, and I thought I had created a unique code that nobody could figure out that substituted numbers for letters and vice versa, and shifted the alphabet, of course, by seven letters. It was easy to figure out. And as a result, the neighborhood kids found a message to my friend Susan, deciphered it, and learned that I had a crush on the boy next door. I was devastated and gave up my aspirations to become a spy early on. It would only be a short matter of time before I would discover that cryptography and its various forms have been around for thousands of years. One of the first documented forms of cryptography comes from Caesar's cipher, where each letter in the alphabet is shifted by three places down the alphabet. It was first used, of course, by Julius Caesar and was documented in his stories about the Gallic Wars, which I will go into in a bit. Even though this mode of cryptography was named after Julius Caesar, who used it with a shift of three letters, cryptography and its various forms had been around for hundreds of years before him. There is a mode of cryptography called steganography, and it includes hidden messages. This process was recounted by Herodotus when the Persian leader Xerxes, the king of kings, had planned to attack Greece's Sparta in 480 BCE. Xerxes thought he had a surefire plan of attack, but little did he know that there had been a spy among the Persians. You see, while Xerxes was mobilizing his forces, Demeritus, a Greek expat who was still loyal to his homeland, was sending messages back to Sparta and Athens using two wax tablets called tabula savata to hide the message. Normally, these wax tablets were used in the classroom as writing tablets. The teachers used tabula sabata, which were wooden writing tablets, and they were recessed, and inside that recessed surface, it held colored wax. Teachers and students would write on the wax with a stylus made of bronze or iron, and then, like an eraser on the pencil, the stylus had a flat end that allowed the student or the teacher to flatten out the wax in order to reuse the wax 
wax that was in the tabula savata. The tabula savata was minimally bound with approximately two to four tablets secured with a clasp. So it looked like a big thick book with tablets. But for Demaratus, it was the perfect spy tool. Herodotus wrote that Demaratus would write Xerxes' plans on the wood and then cover the wood with wax so that Xerxes' guards couldn't see the message. Once the tablets arrived in Greece, they would scrape off the wax to read the messages as they learned Xerxes' plans for invasion. When Xerxes and his Persian troops arrived in Athens, the Greeks enticed the foreign military to Athens' shoreline, which was the Bay of Salamis. Xerxes, thinking he had trapped the Greeks, kept moving in on the bay, unaware that his opponent was preparing to battle. Once one of his ships, the Artemisia, arrived, it was grounded by Greek troops who proceeded to take down the entire Persian army. Steganography was also used in China, as messages were written on pieces of fine silk, crumbled into a tiny ball, and then covered in wax. Messengers, in order to conceal them until they got to their destination, would swallow the ball of wax. And I don't know about you, but I would hate to be on the receiving end of that message. Though steganography is similar to cryptography in that it hides the message, cryptography has a useful method of scrambling the message so that if it is found, it can't be deciphered. Back to Caesar's shift, his letters were first translated from Roman to Greek and then were shifted three letters up so that his cipher alphabet began with D. One of the first documented times of Caesar's cipher was when Julius Caesar was sending messages to his longtime friend and trusted advisor, the Roman senator Cicero. Caesar was attempting to take down the Roman Empire. Well, the Roman Senate was not happy with Caesar. So, during Caesar's attempt to take down the empire, he was sending encrypted messages to Cicero so that his cipher alphabet began with D. The messenger was supposed to deliver the message to Cicero. However, he was instructed that if he couldn't approach the encampment where Cicero was, the messenger was to hurl a spear with the letter fastened to it to the camp. Instead, the messenger hurled the spear at the entrenchment where Cicero was and it stuck in the tower for three days until a guard noticed it. So all throughout the Galactic Wars, Caesar continued to use this form of cryptography and communicate with his advisors and the army. His methods and forms of communication proved to be really effective because, well, he won the Gallic Wars. There are so many instances where cryptography has been useful in war. It was used by George Washington and his troops and and it was used on the morning of February 19th, 1945. U.S. Marines entered the shore of the island of Iwo Jima. This was a planned attack and it lasted for five weeks. However, the advancements that they made on this island would not have been possible if it wasn't for the Navajo code talkers. The Navajos have a special language that has absolutely no association with European or Asian languages. As a result, they were able to create an unbreakable code that allowed for effective communication within our military. Even today, our internet is secure through public key cryptography that was introduced by Stanford engineer Martin Hellman, Whitfield Diffie, and Ralph Merkel. Public key cryptography is a process that uses two keys, a private key that's used to encrypt, decrypt, and digitally sign files, and a public key that's used to encrypt and verify digital signatures. Before these brilliant cryptographers first came up with this concept, encryption and decryption were symmetrical and were basically the same. So, cryptography has evolved in such a phenomenal way that we are now able to use it for cryptocurrency, authentication, privacy, and to deter recent advancements in quantum code breaking. Today, we are faced with the challenge of making encryption that is completely unbreakable. Possibly, we are jinxing the word unbreakable by saying, that encryption can be unbreakable. However, scientists today are currently utilizing key distribution techniques that are derived from quantum computing and are creating keys out of photons in order to create an unbreakable encryption. There's a really good video. It's actually a TED Talk given by John Prisco. He's the CEO of Quantum Exchange. It's a great video that goes into how to make encryption that is unbreakable. And that's literally the title of the TEDx presentation. 
presentation, but it's a good presentation, so I'm going to post it on my website, mathsciencehistory.com. You know, it's just really exciting to see how far we have come in cryptography and encryption, that we can actually create keys out of photons. I honestly can't think of how we could advance further on this level of quantum computing, but that's me, because I always have my head in the past, and I'm learning about history of stuff, and when I read and hear and learn about the advancements that we're making in cryptography now, it really reinstates my faith in the power of science and mathematics and how we create a world that at one point was once unimaginable. I mean, I'm sure Caesar could never imagine that we would have cryptography on this level, right? So, with the exception of history, that really is the power of math and science. Until next week, carpe diem! I'm Gabrielle Burchak. This podcast has been brought to you by Caffeine. Delicious, wonderful, nectar of the gods caffeine. Coffee, tea, coffee candy, you name it. I love it. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you like what you are listening to, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. I would really appreciate that. If you are interested in reading more about the history of math and science, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And while you are there, if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Until next week, carpe diem!